first of all, thank you very much for, for coming to this, um, to this meeting here. Um, I really want this to be, to be a dialogue, a dialogue that starts in this room and continues, uh, continues afterwards. Um, as you know, we'll be speaking about organized crime, a very heavy topic, um, and about organized crime in 2023 and organized crime in the future. And the point of this um, session is to try to share some of the knowledge that you have, uh, uh, that we have, and try to see how that fits with the knowledge that you have. Um, it's really, I mean, uh, you'll see my uh, esteemed colleagues here, they have a lot of experience from uh, various uh, geographical areas, experience on, uh, on, on how crime works, uh, how criminals build their cross-border networks, and that's what we'll try to, to explore right now uh, together. Um, so, um, I'm, uh, I'm Paul Radu, uh, I'm the co-founder of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. As the name, the long name of the organization says, we are focused on investigating crime and corruption for the past more than 15 years, actually. Um, so we've learned quite a bit um, about um, how criminals organize their, their business. Uh, and we started, um, actually, this organization on the back of understanding how crime works. Um, so more than 15 years ago, actually close to 20 years ago, when we uh, started speaking about the idea of, uh, of a network to cover organized crime, uh, we were looking very hard at, at criminals. Um, I was, uh, together with my co-founder, going from jail to jail in Eastern Europe to interview criminals to find out how they work, how they think, why are they doing what they are doing. Uh, and one of the first realizations from that, uh, and that was a long time ago, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, was that criminals always operate across borders. Criminals always operate in networks. And this is something, I mean, I see in this room a lot of you now with, with experience um, in covering organized crime. There's almost no local organized crime story. Uh, it's, there's always some international dimension to it. Um, with me um, today, um, I have in the order um, right here, um, Cecilia Annesi, uh, who is um, the co-founder of Irvi Media uh, in Italy. Um, they're a very uh, respected uh, media outlet, not just in Italy, but worldwide, uh, working a lot uh, with some of you here uh, in South America, in Mexico, in Africa, all over the place. Um, and Cecilia, she's herself an expert in uh, Ndrangheta and other Italian uh, mafia groups. Um, and uh, you're, you're right now the director of, uh, of IRP Media, right? Uh, not that the title would... The director of, of, of the center, yes, yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, I just want to wish you welcome here, uh, Cecilia. And Cecilia will, will have a lot of experience to, to share with us, uh, a lot to tell us. Um, next, uh, we have um, uh, Bertil Lindner. Um, Bertil, uh, if I may, uh, has worked on um, organized crime and, uh, and other, other issues uh, for, for a long time. He's published 22 books. An impressive number. I, I think every investigative reporter wish, you know, wishes to, to publish books, and uh, 22 it's, uh, it's, it's a big number. Um, these books are on Asian history, are on politics, uh, and, and obviously crime. Um, he is currently with his own company called the Asia Pacific Media Services, um, but he has been for 22 years with the Far Eastern Economic Review, uh, and uh, here in Sweden with the uh, Svenska Dagbladet. Uh, and other uh, other media outlets. He's hailing right now from uh, from Thailand, uh, where where he currently lives, and uh, I think he he has to <laughs> to also share lots of insights on Asian organized crime. And you see, it's it's a bit of a different flavor than uh, than the other other groups uh, that will be uh, spoke will spoken about uh, uh, here. Um, then we have um, Anabel Hernandez Garcia, uh, who's a Mexican investigative reporter and author as well. And Annabelle, uh, she has uh, investigated organized crime for, uh, again, for, for quite some time in, in her own country. But she's also looked at the cross-border connections between the Mexican organized crime groups and, for instance, law enforcement in the United States and elsewhere. And she's, she's looking at uh, the transnational uh, characteristics of uh, uh, the Sinaloa drug cartel and, and other, other groups uh, from Mexico. Um, she's also done uh, work on uh, slave uh, labor, forced labor, on uh, human trafficking, um, abuse of the government power, and other issues. I mean, there's always this convergence of, of crime, right? When you investigate organized crime, you don't, you don't just focus on a group. You, you focus a lot on the crime. So uh, thank you for, for being here, Annabelle. 
Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, Cecilia's uh, partner in, in crime, another director uh, at this table. Uh, we're, we're actually too many directors in this, in this panel. You know, it's like a, it's a panel of directors. We'll be directing something at the end of the day, probably. Um, so Giulio, uh, Giulio Rubino, um, he's uh, uh, the other, uh, another co-founder of uh, IRP Media uh, and the director of the organization. Uh, he has published in you know, quite a few Italian uh, uh, media outlets. Uh, and he, I know he's trained journalists uh, all over the place. Uh, he's also very active in uh, South America and other countries because Italy, Italy unfortunately is, uh, or fortunately, is so well connected when it comes to, to organized crime that, uh, you know, there's always need for an Italian in the room, in the room or in the newsroom. <laughs> there's no organized crime newsroom without an Italian in, in my view, you know. And, in that respect, you know, the, the Mexicans are not far off, uh, from, from there too. I mean, Mexicans are, are always needed because it's, it's such a huge country with such a huge footprint when it comes to organized crime. So, um, I'll make it very short now. Uh, how we see this meeting going is, um, uh, there's going to be three parts. One is, we're going to go uh, one by one um, through three things. What are uh, the newest developments that you saw with organized crime that you looked at? you know, in Italy, in Asia, in, in Mexico, and worldwide. So this is going to be the first part. Um, then we'll segue to the second part, which is going to be, each of, each of them are going to present you with three instruments or three strategies that they found most useful to investigate organized crime in the year of grace 2023. And then we'll also leave uh, some time for uh, your questions and for a bit of dialogue, but again, Time being limited, you know, we're probably going to have about 15, 20 minutes for questions, and then we'll move out and we'll probably continue this uh, this dialogue uh, afterward. Um, so um, let me um, uh, actually start uh, with uh, Bertil. Bertil, uh, would you be so kind to, to come here and uh, introduce us to the three most interesting uh, developments with organized crime in your part of the world, please? Thank you very much, Paul. A little bit more than that, actually. First of all, I would like to add a few words about ethnic organized crime. When we're talking about Chinese organized crime, Japanese organized crime, Russian organized crime, Italian organized crime, and so on, <clears throat> the media says there's a group of criminals who belong to a particular ethnic fraternity. Not that all the those national, national, nationalities as such are in any way criminal. And it's very often these very communities will suffer the most from organized crime in their midst. And <clears throat> There is nothing, nothing new, really. And we also remember that it's not really that compartmentalized. It doesn't necessarily be confined to one ethnic group. It tends to overlap. But that said, organized crime and criminals may live outside the law, but they never live outside society. And this is particularly true in Asia, and perhaps in other parts of the world as, as well. In Asia, there's always been a symbiosis between law and crime. There are certain things that governments, intelligence agencies, big businesses just can't do themselves. So they turn to organized crime gangs to do the dirty work for them. And in return, those groups get protection for the more unsavory activities, such as drugs, prostitution, or in protection rackets. There's an old, <coughs> an old range, but, but the pattern remains the same. What is new, though, I would say, is that one, and first of all, Organized crime in Asia is increasingly moving from the streets to boardrooms and institutions of power. And two, they're starting to use digital resources. Internet, they're using the internet for scams, fraud, and extortion. And three, they're also increasingly using cryptocurrencies to transfer money and to launder money. Those are the three most important new elements into organized crime in East Asia. And to give an example how that works and how this trans transformation has taken place, I'd like to tell you a story about a man called one called Koi. Uh, he's also known as Broken Tooth Koi. Uh, <clears throat> he began his career as a street fighter in a street gang in Macau when he was still under Portuguese rule. And he lost his teeth in several of the street fights, and that's why he was called Broken Tooth, he got that nickname. But he graduated to becoming a full fledged member of the tribes, because not all street fighters are members of the tribe. And then he rose to become the head of the 14K tribe in Macau, the most powerful uh, tribe in the, in the city at that time. But he was really too flamboyant for his, you know, he won't do it. He was driving around in a car, 
with illustration number 14K, and this sort of thing. He was basically laughing at, at, at the authority. So he was arrested in 1998, the year before Macau reverted to Chinese rule, and he spent 15 years in prison in a top security facility that was built especially for him and his closest associates. But then in 2012, he was released and it was clear that the Chinese authorities, now in charge of Macau, realized that he could be quite useful for their purposes as well. So he first appeared in Cambodia. He couldn't really continue in Macau. It was too well known there. And then he set up a number of new companies with very fanciful names, uh, <clears throat> such as uh, the Hongman History and Cultural Association. Uh, and the Palau China Hongman Cultural Association, supposedly based in the Pacific Island of, of Palau. Of any of you are familiar with uh, triad history, Hongman was the original triad. He wasn't even trying to try it, to hide it. He was that open and, and honest about it. Yes, I am a triad boss, and these are my companies now. But they were all perfectly incorporated in Hong Kong, Cambodia, and, and uh, not in Palau. I don't know why they chose that particular jurisdiction. <clears throat> so <clears throat> then uh, he set up a number of businesses in Cambodia, but it was mainly in the gambling casino business, but it became a little bit too hot for him there. So then he made a strategic move to eastern Myanmar, because there there was an area controlled by a local ethnic armed organization, which was recognized in, with the, by the Myanmar military, and a close connection with the Myanmar's military authorities. They basically had only the free zone, you know, the border there. And then in April 2017, he started building something called the Yatai New City. And when completed, it was supposed to include luxury housing, hotels, shopping malls, trade centers, factories, golf courses, casinos, and perhaps even an airport. I managed to get into that area in 2019. I was smuggled into that by some friendly local people. They wanted me to see what was going on there. And it was absolutely mind boggling. But more precisely, this area became a center for uh, online scams. They recruited IT specialists from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, English speaking, to come there and use the internet to defraud people across the globe. But meanwhile, uh, Broken Tooth had, had his teeth fixed, so he looks quite okay now. And uh, <clears throat> you, you wouldn't see him in any baggy trousers or you know, <clears throat> a cloth flip flops or anything like that. He comes in the business suit and a necktie, and a perfectly legitimate businessman, according to himself. And it's also extremely well protected and well connected, especially with China's military intelligence services. So he has actually moved from being a sea fighter to being a trial member, a trial boss, and into what he is today. But is he a criminal or not? Yes, of course he is. Because it, <clears throat> what is a real big problem is all the scams going on inside this area. It's out of reach from any international law enforcement agency if they are even interested in moving against it. And he, more than anybody else, I would say, symbolizes and shows the new face of organized crime in East Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Bertel. Uh, yeah, um, an interesting view, right, on the the evolution of a, of a street street fighter to someone in a, in a boardroom. Uh, and I think the next stage, and we've, we've heard from your glimpses um, about that, you know, from Broken Tooth, is these people usually become what I call criminal angel investors. They will invest in more crime. You know, they, they already amassed a lot, lots of wealth, lots of knowledge, and now they're ready to kind of finance and help the next generation of, uh, of criminals. Somehow, how we do here, you know, we try to, we're trying to grow the next generation of investigative reporters, you know, for her working on crime and corruption, except for much less money. Um, so, <laughs> um, organized crime is audacious. I mean, they, they put, you know, names to their companies that are, you know, off the hook, let's say, and, and, and I've seen this before. They set up companies across the, the street from the organized crime unit, you know, like, for instance, what happened in Bucharest in my, um, uh, in my country, you know, there was a criminal group that set up a, a, a company right across the street from the police. I mean, they're, they're audacious, uh, these people. So, speaking about audacious, um, let's go to, to Chechi, to Cecilia, to hear about one of the 
I think most uh, innovative organized crime groups in the world uh, and one, one that has you know, immense reach. So yeah, as Paul said, we are going to be speaking about Indrangheta, which is, uh, first of all, a mafia that is hard to pronounce. Um, just very quickly, we have four um, mafias, so four organized crime groups in Italy, the Indrangheta, the Cosa Nostra, the Camorra, and the Sacra Corona Unita. Why do we speak about Indrangheta today is because why you surely all heard about the Cosa Nostra, uh, you might not have heard of the Indrangheta, although it's actually the richest and most powerful mafia that we currently have in Italy, and unfortunately, it's um, nearly present in the whole world. Um, so, why it is innovative? It is innovative, uh, first of all, because it has left what we describe as coppola and lupara, so the hat and gun style. Um, it is still a very violent and dangerous mafia, but uh, the majority of the members of this mafia are quite invisible. There is one characteristic that is true for all the Italian mafias, and they're, they're family-based. However, the Indrangheta is highly family-based. It means that it's super hard to, to infiltrate because you cannot convince a mother that you're the seventh son. <laughs> Which means that for cops, it has been possible to infiltrate the kind of borders of the organization. So perhaps they've been opening in production companies at some ports. Um, so they can manage to, let's say, touch the outside structure of the mafia, but it's really impossible to get in the structure which also means that up to today is really hard to know uh, for investigators but also for journalists how the, this mafia actually works. We have, um, so some, some investigations have unveiled the sound of the structure by finding uh, some books, some writings, and by talking to the pentiti, so the people who are quitting that mafia. But um, it's still not up to today when Paul before was saying we're quite late. We're definitely late because it's a super evol quickly evolving mafia. But there is one important innovation that I had compared to other mafias. It's a hierarchical structure in terms of grades that you get. In you start with a like a street member, and then you get up to the top. And when you get to the top, uh, the top is made of more layers of top. And the first layer of that top is called Santa, which means saint, because it's also a mafia that is very similar to religion, uh, Catholic regi religion, and a lot of symbolism. We won't get into that. But with the Santa, it means that a, a member of the Indrangheta is also a boss, and then there's a lot of type of bosses of different territorial units, but we won't get into that. With that Santa, that boss will be able to talk not only to other criminal organizations around the world and make deals for the Indrangheta, but also to businessmen and to politics, and most importantly, to masonry. So it be, basically, what is innovative is because you get a grade that allows you to go around the world and make deals. These basically um, created what uh, recently uh, Calabrian prosecutors, anti-mafia prosecutors, described as a criminal corporate threat to democracy around the whole world. Um, not only because of the structure of infiltration in, in institutional, let's say at institutional level in different countries, we're not talking only about Italy, there's been many cases lately in the world that we could look at, Germany, Slovakia, Argentina, and so on and so forth, but also at the capacity of um, providing immense amount of economic flows into legal economy in the whole world. Uh, so what we're looking at today are brokers who can speak six languages, who are well-dressed, and who are super high-tech, and they can uh, use cyber um, crime or crypto phones uh, as they go. Um, what we notice very briefly uh, with these people moving around the world is that uh, they now have deals with uh, some of the most dangerous uh, narco structures of the world, including in countries that until some years ago didn't seem to have such a role. Uh, one of them, for example, is Paraguay, um, and uh, then Brazil and Colombia, of course, and Mexico. Um, the way they have uh, dealt with criminal organizations like El Primer Comando de Capital and with the Urabenos in uh, Uraba, 
means that they're uh, really, really close and they can uh, finance big chunks of the cocaine trade, which is so far still the main entry, economic entry for the Andrangheta. Um, by following the money together with OCCRP and partners in different countries of the world, we came up to uh, analyze two innovations that are big time innovations. Uh, one of them is basically uh, managing to either own or uh, be present into fake banks institutions, which means that uh, Andrangheta money is entering a lot of financial means from um, bonds to uh, different type of um, investments in, in the finance, which means that it's really, really hard to trace it back to criminal um, incomes. And uh, with OCCRP, we, we spoke about, a, we wrote about a bank called Bandinia that is not actually a bank and that moved about 30 billion billion euros around the world, just to give you one number, which is of, cor of course just the tip of the iceberg. And the uh, most innovative idea that the Indrangheta had lately, it's a what investigators are still not too sure uh, how to describe and how to call, but they, try to call it uh, compensation chambers, and they're managed by Chinese organizations all over the world. They're based in uh, Rotterdam, uh, Antwerp, um, uh, Rome, what have you, Mexico City, and basically the narco money. So I'm a Calabrian narco and I need to send 4 million euros to Mexico, and instead of having a bank transaction, I go to a Chinese shop, I just, put 4 million euros cash, and that money appears at the other end of the world without moving, which is definitely, at least for us, the most innovative idea they had, and we are definitely quite late into understanding how that exactly works. Thank you. Thank you, Chesha. This was right on time. Um, I mean, I, I think one, one of the powers, one of the strengths of Ndrangheta that uh, Cecilia is investigating so much is the fact that they, they are very much focused on the logistics of crime. They own ports. They, own, they, they work with shipping companies for a long, long time. So this is what gives them like a connection to many other criminal groups. So now uh, Giulio will, will continue uh, speaking about Italian uh, organized crime. Please, Giulio. Thank you, Paul. And uh, with a great introduction by Cecilia, because I would say that uh, while lately we're actually seeing that many other uh, criminal groups are gaining a lot of traction in the drug trafficking world, and uh, uh, especially talking about direct contacts with South American suppliers of cocaine. And, and of course, I mean, mafias, organized crime touch all kinds of drugs, but in terms of uh, demand, bulk, and raising price from the moment you buy it to the moment you sell it, uh, cocaine is still the most important drug, and of, of course, you know there are there is fentanyl. There are a lot of synthetic drugs which are which probably have even a higher uh, impact on society, do a more more damage to society. But in financial terms, still cocaine is the biggest one. And I would say that Ndrangheta maybe today might not be the biggest player in drug trafficking, and this is really debatable. It's really something that we want to explore, but they're still a big player, but they are probably the most uh, financially advanced the mafia. No, I would say that, you know, all the tools and uh, products of um, finance around the world, many of those products are sadly aimed at anonymizing capital for tax illusion region reasons, not even evasion, really illusion, right? These are perfectly legal tools that the fin financial institution keep on developing all over the world. And uh, the Ndrangheta has learned very quickly and very soon to use them all. Basically creating a situation in which the criminal economy is perfectly synergic with the capitalist one. There is no longer like the idea of um, additional taxation on poor businesses that you had in Sicily for extortion is an old model that is no longer very relevant in tracing the real money that the mafia is making. That money is clean. And that leads me to um, try and focus, I mean, in focusing it on three points is pretty hard, but I would say that what we're looking at is a generational change. The, the, we had a generation of mafia that until 2012, 2015, was extremely strong, very good bosses with immense connection, very smart, and um, also thanks for, to a, a very effective law enforcement operations in Italy, 
but also thanks to <clears throat> old age, these guys are mostly leaving the spot to a younger generation. And as it often happens, the sons of very successful businessmen might not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. So, you know, uh, the, this is the, the, the structure, the pyramid structure that was so effective is apparently, at least in some parts, starting to crumble. And we see a, a huge rise in collaboration with other groups, especially in Europe. So I'm from Rome. Uh, my city is famous for uh, Pax Romana of Mafia. Many different groups of organized crime live together in Rome in relative peace. And this peace is starting to crumble now uh, because of a, a, a non-perfectly peaceful collaboration between Italian groups, um, groups of Albanian origin, groups of a Roma ethnic origin, although Romas that have settled in Rome, like, I don't know, 100 years ago, like, it's, it's the Italian Roma um, people, the Casa Monica, uh, for the ones who know them. And uh, all of these groups have a much more tense peace ongoing. Like, in my neighborhood, since June, there have been three mafia murders, like, a few blocks from my home. And uh, these murders have been uh, foreshadowed by a series of arsons two and a half years ago when, you know, libraries, places of social uh, interaction have been deemed uh, problematic by the Mafia that wanted to keep the, um, the you know, the, the drug dealing spaces. And again, this leads to another thing that connects everything I've just said. We've discovered in our recent investigations exactly in my neighborhood how uh, criminal capital is a big driver of gentrification. This is extremely interesting because it also gives us as journalists a new way to connect to our audience in, in a way that is much more easy and much more felt than abstract organized crime that they don't see because you know the rise of prices of uh, rents, the rise of prices of stuff is actually driven by international anonymous investment funds but those investment funds have shitloads of mafia money inside of it because it has been anonymized through these tools that we were saying before, and it comes together. So basically, they bring to our, they are bringing to my neighborhood two parallel structures. One that is clean capital, already cleaned a long time ago, buying houses and businesses, and the dirty capital that is getting more interesting because, of course, gentrification drives more nightlife and more demand for drugs. So both things are perfectly uh, helping each other. There are two flips of the same coin, and we're, we're seeing this rise very much. The collaboration with different organized crime groups, like Paul was saying, Mafia uh, controls a lot of ports, but they're also kind of losing them for the same reason. Like the generation is changing, the new generation is not that effective, the new groups already have direct contacts in South America with the suppliers. So the ports of Rotterdam and, and Antwerp are now much more under control of Albanian and Moroccan groups than under direct control of the Mafia. This has started as a sort of outsourcing from the Italian Mafia that would make the more dangerous and dirty job uh, would give them this job to smaller and weaker criminal groups. But in time, these groups know how to play the game. They become very strong. Up to the point that we observed something that uh, before, before now I would have thought absurd, that a uh, drug bought from a, a, an Albanian group in Rotterdam was carried by a smaller Italian Drangheta family, still part of the Drangheta in the important families, but small groups that had half crumbled, the big bosses were in jail, so this family was not as powerful as it used to be. Um, and, and they brought the drug to Rome to sell it to other Albanian groups, which uh, it's interesting also because it shows that these Albanian groups are not yet under the same pyramid structure. They not, do not have a direct contact. It was the Ndrangheta to provide the contact between the suppliers. So I think that, at least in Europe, we really have to look at a lot of different fragmented groups working together. And they all, they're all they all going to bring the money together to the same Chinese shop, anonymous Chinese shop. But what is very interesting that I'm sure everybody noticed that the shipments that arrive in Europe are growing in quantity, usually. Like, nobody has the logistic to manage on its own seven tons that come at the same time. And these are the kind of of uh, weights that we talk about, that we hear in wiretaps that sometimes arrive, sometimes are seized. But that, that means that a lot of different groups put their money together. And the Nrangheta being the richest is very often like the guarantee that the deal is going to, be, is going to go. Like they, they guarantee that they, they know how to handle that kind of cash. It's like when we ask money to a donor, like we can't ask that much more than we are used to managing our budget. So the, the, the Nrangheta provides that uh, safety. But actually, the drug is already being sold to a lot of different groups, and when it arrives in uh, in any port, it you know spreads over you know Germany, Netherlands, 
all over the place very quickly, already going like 50 kilos there, 150 kilos there, 200 kilos there, according to what are the places of dealing that this organization manage. Um, I would say that these are actually <laughs> the the biggest uh, the biggest innovation that we that we saw so far, and uh, mm, of course we are still trying to you know make sense of a lot of them and to explore how these connections work. But we see a lot of fluidity and groups that were more cartel like are learning a bit from the pyramidal structure of Ndrangheta and Ndrangheta also thanks to the, the, the fight of civil society journalists and law enforcement against them is forced to work in a way that is not the solid, solid structure that they were used to. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, and I think this was a great Italian perspective on, uh, on organized crime and um, obviously, um, as Giulio pointed out, everything is in flux. Organized crime is so flexible, so ad adaptable. Um, and I, I believe that Italian uh, mafias, they provided a blueprint for many other organized crime groups around the world, actually, over the years. And there's certainly lots of interactions between them and other organized crime groups right now. And let's, let's hear a little bit uh, from Mexico. Uh, so Annabel has, uh, has done a lot of work on organized crime in Mexico, and I think there are connections between the Italian mafias and um, the, the, the groups in uh, your country. So please, Annabel. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this important uh, conference. I ask you to put the map. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I just want to, to share with you my own concept about organized crime. Um, because I think that sometimes we lost some points when we are investigating these issues as a journalist. First of all, uh, in my experience, I have, been, I have been investigating the Sinaloa cartel, one of the biggest cartels, one of the biggest trafficking drugs organization in the world. All the red part is Sinaloa cartel territory. There, that is their presence. And in the yellow part, they are just starting. Can you see? Almost all the world is contaminated by the organized crime organization that I have been investigating for the last 20 years. So uh, for me, currently, organized crime is a conglomerate of illegal interests made up of organized crime groups that are able to do this with two, three main partners. <coughs> Mostly, we just see the organized group, groups, but we don't see, we almost don't put, don't put attention to the partners. These partners that let them do all these things are parts of the government, not just in Mexico, not just in Mexico, because these drugs arrive everywhere, is it? arrives everywhere. So the corruption is everywhere. Many times, European uh, media or US media used to say, oh, yes, Latin American, they are very corrupted, savage, third world. No, 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 no. These drugs arise because the corruption is in all that territory. This is the only way how tons of cocaine, tons of fetamines, tons of fetamine can arrive. Are they transparent? No. They need cross the frontiers, so they need the corruption. The problem is, yes, it's true, that in countries as Mexico, the, co the corruption is, is institutional. In other countries, could could not be like this. But we have to, as, as, as a journalist, put our eye on that. Not just the, the, the government, the, corruption, the corrupt people is very happy. Oh, yes, talk about the Sinaloa cartel, talk about Trangheta, talk about the Chinese mafia. No, no, no. We have to talk about also that partners. Exist a and a second partner that is crucial to investigate, the businessman. I can tell you, in my investigations, I have found that many of the main transnational companies Legal companies that produce chicken, uh, eggs, meat, that tra that transport um, uh, mer mercants, mercants yeah, how do say goods in all the world are part partners of the Sinaloa cartel and other cartels. So we have to put our eye in these companies. And what about the banks? 
Yes, exist systems, as, as my colleague explained, that these Chinese uh, places where you can put, but also a lot of legal banks that they help them take money from them. I have been talking with lawyers of the Sinaloa cartel that said banks are fighting for our money because they are, for example, HSBC, the huge scandal. They asked for the 3% from their task just to be able to traffic to move your money. But what's Fargo? No, no, no. Okay, I ask you too. Just 2%. And they were like, no, no, no. Just 1%. They are fighting for that money. Because most, many of our economy, even in countries like this, are moved by illegal money. So we have to put our eye on that. And which is the third partner? Common people like us, consumers of the, these terrible product, products of these gangs, organized crime um, uh, organizations. And, and when, I'm, when I'm talking about products, it's not just drugs. That is a nice face of these people. They are trafficking women, sex, sex exploitation, for child, child, child pornography. They are destroying our water. They are contaminating our water. They also uh, exploitation, explode illegally our natural resource. They explode illegally mines. We are talking about really one of the Sounds like a cliche, but right now, as a journalist, we, we have to really understand that most of the problems now in the world cross by organized crime. There's no way that doesn't cross. So we have to be prepared in different areas, economic areas, political areas, uh, different areas, to be able to understand this phenomenon and try together to fight against this huge monster. So talking about new things, it's difficult to, to talk about new things. I think that we are talking about evolution. So because they this organized crime, because they have these very smart partners, I mean, corrupted government, illegal uh, uh, business, they really can see the future earlier than, than us. So they are very smart to see how the market of consume of drugs are moving. And they push the movement to one way or another one. Right now, exists a very, very dramatic problem is the, this mortal uh, epidemic from fentanyl. I don't know if you have heard about this. In, in the United States, it exists, exists a, a, a very huge problem about this, but also in Canada. After the even in the United States, many of the, the just 70,000 people have been murdered be consuming this fentanyl just between 2020 to 2021, but also in Canada. And no one, have, have you heard about Canada? Well, just they already, this, they have this problem now. And now in Europe, in Italy, some, some, um, treatments of, of, of fatality have been found. So they arrive in Europe. So that is another thing that we have to focus as a journalist. What about fentanyl? What about this phenomenon? We have to understand the consequence. We have to understand um, how, how many consumers they are. We, the government doesn't want to talk about this. There's not, uh, uh, there's not information enough, and we have to understand it. And uh, of course, as you know, the fentanyl, the most important organized, traf uh, organized crime that is trafficking these drugs are Sinaloa cartel, again. So you see, they can traffic all this, war, this very dangerous drug in all this territory. And for the last time, for, for the last point, I want to I want to say about cocaine. My colleague said cocaine is still the big business. Yes, yes. Cartels are moving to create new drugs, new markets, but cocaine is still very important. 
Have you heard about this candidate for the president in Ecuador that was murdered? He was threatened before by the Sinaloa cartel, and now he's murdered. Then, before that, exist many bombs in the streets in Ecuador, exist, exist control by the Sinaloa cartel and the cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación that they are fighting not just by, by Ecuador, they are fighting for all the Central America and Sud America con, uh, region. And right now, and I will finish with this. I, I, I have many things to say, but can you put it in the other map, please? The, well, can you see? This is Colombia. As you well know, Colombia is still being the main producer of cocaine in the world. The, can you see who are controlling all the frontiers, all the points to Venezuela, to Brazil, to Peru, all the country? All the frontiers, Sinaloa Cartel and Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación. They are just not 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 yesterday. They arrived through the last years. They are now in Colombia. Even the new president want to try to control these groups that didn't want to sign the Pacific Threat in in in, in, in Colombia. They don't want it because they still traffic in drugs, because cocaine is still a very important drug. And they are, the main partners are the Sinaloa Cartel and Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación. And this issue, the war for the cocaine, will be a problem, a huge problem. This is just starting. Will be a huge problem in Central America and South America. And all this, we have to remember, is because they there is the third partner, the consumers. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you hear from such dedicated journalists, and it's, it's just amazing. It, it, it's, it's so inspiring. Um, and Annabel is right. I mean, you know, there's lots of complicities uh, at work. And sometimes, you know, um, we don't see how organized crime influences our, our lives. Um, I, I, I live for, for quite some time in Mexico, and you can feel it there, right? And there's elections, and candidates get, get murdered, and all that, and, and you see it, you see it. But, you know, I mean, we've, we've investigated our other electoral campaigns in other countries where organized crime has infiltrated, maybe not at the same level, not at the same level of violence, but, you know, organized crime is all around us, and we're just grasping to it. And, uh, you know, um, I think listening to, to people like Annabel, you know, we realize the extent of, uh, of this dire, dire problem. Um, uh, so now, <laughs> let's uh, try to move a little bit on the um, more optimistic side, if there is any. Uh, um, is that, um, I mean, really, you know, I mean, these, these people, although they, they have a degree of impunity because they operate at the transnational level where there's no natural enemy, except for investigative reporters like um, Annabel, like Verdi, like Churchill, like Julio, you know, like you here, you know, th there's really, I mean, they have a lot of territory to, to cover. And think about the numbers, you know, how many Annabels do you think you have in the world? <laughs> Probably not, not that many. Um, and, uh, you know, how many criminals do you have in the world? A lot more and with a lot more resources um, and with a lot more accomplices, unfortunately. And banks, banks are also, I mean, amazingly important. And we'll have, have a session later today about banks and their role in um, supplying organized crime and corrupt politicians with instruments they need, uh, not just for their money laundering, but, but for many other things. So now we'll move to the second part uh, of our presentation here. And that's going to be about speaking about um, strategies, you know, very briefly, very succinctly, about strategies that you can employ, that they employ in order to investigate organized crime in recent years. I mean, there's a lot to, to speak about, but uh, um, I'll, um, I'll start with, uh, with Chechi, actually, if you don't mind, Chechi. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll go to uh, Annabel and then to, to, to Bertil, uh, finally. Um, and then we'll open up for, uh, for questions right after that. So let's hear about some efficient strategies in investigating organized crime in 2023. Julio will go before Chechi, absolutely. We're very flexible, just like organized crime. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, thank you. And um, uh, it's, it's hard to say because, you know, um, the strategies that we used have been in place uh, for a number of years now, and they're in some cases still effective, and Shichita will talk about many of those, uh, both newer and, uh, and a bit older that we employ. I wanted to focus on one thing that is connected to the story I was talking about before, like the, the, the entry of a lot of uh, mafia capital through the gentrification processes in parts of my town. So, um, <clears throat> IRP is collaborating with a think tank from the University of Milan. They have developed a, a tool that's called Datacross, and it basically allows us to quickly um, scan um, economic activities, commercial activities, for red flags of certain kinds. Count, um, discrepancies in the accounts, uh, kind of money that came in when. So basically we started using this tool and we've been, uh, we, we experimented this tool in this investigation first. And uh, it all came from, you know, the, the intuition, which is pretty banal to be honest, that uh, thanks to the pandemic, there was a huge chance for a group that has a lot of liquidity, like the Italian Mafia, to buy entire chunks of the city. So this was uh, the hypothesis that we wanted to prove. And so we basically, um, so the, the, I, don't, I don't know internationally, in Italy there is a code that's called Ateco code that uh, defines the kind of activity. So all restaurants have the same code and all other. So we, we selected a number of codes focusing on cash-based business, and we asked the, the algorithm, which is just a tool to do it faster, basically you can do it even with normal uh, company documents. We tried to check all the companies that had a significant change in capital property over the last two years, because we realized, speaking with sources, that um, this was a new way in which Mafia entered the activities. Instead of doing usury or, you know, um, money loans, the old style, they would just buy a part of the company. They would enter as partners. So we scanned all the uh, commercial cash-based activities that had had new partners coming in with significant capital during the pandemic. The tool was extremely effective. We um, managed to estimate, a very conservative estimate, that at least 10% of all commercial activities in my neighborhood are in a way owned or partially owned by organized crime. And of course, for security and safety reasons, because of what I was telling you before, we didn't name them uh, specifically in the, in the investigation. We focused on the methodology and why, why this is useful and important. And yeah, this not only uh, gave us a new perspective, a new point of view into uh, how organized crime work, but it allows us to unlock another uh, relative innovation that we, we, we are starting to work on. So you can imagine that uh, some of the people that know neighborhoods and understand criminal activity best are often activists, are often, you know, in my neighborhood, uh, my neighborhood is a working class area with a long history of squats and social centers and activities of this kind. Now, these people are extremely allergic to the word legality for obvious reasons. They've been oppressed by the police forever in their activities, and it ends up that they understand how the crime is entering areas of the city or how it moves at a ground level much better than most journalists and surely often better than the cops, but they don't collaborate with anybody because they are absolutely allergic to this idea of, you know, oh, we have to do everything by the law because they've been beaten by the police so often during demonstrations and stuff like that that they don't trust the police. But framing our investigation as a, also an investigation on the gentrification of the neighborhood, we suddenly picked their interest. So we found a new way to unlock collaboration between civil society and journalism. And this is giving us a lot of, a lot of satisfaction, a lot of fruit is opening up a lot of new sources. And uh, we're already almost ready for the second part of this investigation. I want to extend the method to other cities in Italy. And, uh, and I think that, yeah, in pure, in purely in terms of innovative investigative approach, this is my main uh, pickup. <laughs> then, can you talk about this? Um, so, I just want to say that we do a lot of the old style work, uh, a lot of field work, a lot of analysis of companies. But there is one thing that maybe is not that innovative, meaning that it's been going on for some years, but that there are leaks. And when it, what leaks uh, help us with is finding that data or that money flows that uh, the organized crime was hiding from civil society. So just to mention one, case, one 
big collaboration that is with Secret. Uh, for us, for example, it was very useful to manage and find the money that the Italian investigators couldn't find. Like we found them 10 years later and we could trace them all the way to then in the end, uh, through Switzerland, all the way uh, till the Miami real estate. That's the part of work that the Miami Herald colleagues did. So, I mean, um, leaks can definitely provide you information and, and data that you don't have out there in the company records. And that paired with the international network and collaboration that for us is absolutely uh, the basis to do these investigations because again, as you've seen, the Indrangheta is a cross-border organization and an international organization. We could never uh, go without the international part. So we do work a lot on territories um, in the old way, like we physically go to Calabria because we need to understand what's new over there and we need to understand how phenomena are born and why certain things can still happen because there is the absence and the corruption of the Italian state and at the same time how that is taken to an international level. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, the, the, this innovation that you can tackle organized crime from the point of view of data journalism is quite important because that's where we can be very, very creative. I mean, organized crime can control certain things, but they cannot control data and they cannot control time. And the opening of more databases, public and private databases, or leaks or whatever, it's always going to uh, create opportunity for us. Uh, Bertil, could you present us with a, a bit of your strategy? <laughs> uh, I think the cartoon sums up everything we've been talking about today, really. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I can sort of say what well, is very difficult to write about, but very difficult to prove, and that is, of course, money laundering, especially now when cryptocurrencies have entered the scene. I mentioned this uh, free zone in the eastern part of Myanmar earlier today, just a while ago. And I, I've been told that there are millions and millions of dollars being transferred from that area, being created through all these over, online scams and other activities, back to through cryptocurrencies, through various intermediaries in Cambodia and Hong Kong, back to, back to China. But to, tra to trace that is extremely difficult. What would be easier for any investigative journalist would be to simply explain how it works. And I think that is quite, quite enough. Paul mentioned that we should talk to criminals. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. You should. And sometimes they can be much more open, you know, open and forthcoming than you could possibly imagine. I mentioned uh, Broken Tooth, for instance. When he was in his top security bunker in Macau, supposedly in solitary confinement, I was sitting with a fellow journalist in Hong Kong, a crime reporter, local crime reporter, in Chiang Mai, where I live. And we started talking about Broken Tooth. So he said, uh, would you like to talk to Broken, Broken Tooth? And I said, yeah, why not? So he picked up his mobile phone and he rang him. So he was there in his bunker having a great time. He was, he, he was not complaining about anything. The food was good. He could watch movies. And uh, uh, he had his phone. He could talk to all his friends and so on. Because obviously the authorities had realized that he would be a useful future uh, too sometime in the, in the future. So talk to criminals if you can. But of course, be careful. So, <clears throat> what are the other tools you can use? Well, databases, the internet, and so on. Yes, it's useful for background, for general knowledge, to you know, broaden your, your, your perspectives to understand what, how it works, what is happening, what's going on. But when I taught uh, investigative journalism in Yangon before the coup in 2021, I always told my trainees, so to speak, that there is actually no software you can use to investigate this kind of organized crime we're talking about. But there are some important hardware. <laughs> you have to go out in the field. You have to talk to people. And as uh, Guido said, uh, you talk to activists. They're local activists. They're not much more. They're much more willing to talk than the police, for instance. They won't say anything. They will probably give us some words, but they, 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 that's about it. Government agencies, forget about them. The UN are nah, useless. <laughs> but <clears throat> in my experience, when I've been out in the field. I talk to local people, they can be NGOs, they can be CSO, people who live in these communities, who may not be able to do anything about it, but they, get, they tell you what is happening there, get an understanding 
uh, of the problem, you get a feel for the whole situation. And that is, nothing is more valuable than that. And <clears throat> but while you're doing that, the most important thing you have to think about is safety. And safety not only for yourself, but safety for the sources you talk to. To make sure that you protect them, so they can in no way be identified in what you write and produce eventually, or if you make a documentary or whatever, a film. And <clears throat> the, the safety, uh, physical threats, I could say, during your, the, the, the time when you do your investigations, then you also have a question of safety after you have published your stories. Legal protection. Good people, nice people, they don't sue people for libel. If you don't like what I write, they would call me and say, Alberto, you did this bullshit, why did you write that? They wouldn't go to the courts. Yes, I have been sued, but not by anyone who was a nice guy. Because <laughs> these people have no other recourse than to go to the court and misuse the law in order to silence you. But then you have to be prepared. And it's a very good idea to keep in close touch in, in, with um, people in the legal profession who will be willing to help you if you get into legal trouble. So that's basically what I have to say. And if you have any questions, I would be better to answer them after all this. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, legs are more, most important, right, for field work. Uh, Bertil is right. Um, I'd, I'd also say that in speaking with people, what we must acknowledge as investigative reporters is that we are the ones putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Even if you speak with law enforcement in a country, they will have, you know, a little bit of the puzzle. But then when you combine, you know, judicial records from various jurisdictions, from various uh, countries, that's when you really see the organized crime group and how wide and how powerful um, they are. Um, so, Annabelle. The floor is yours. Again, it's a lot of things to say, but I will try to, to, to make a resume. So, what I have learned in, this, uh, in all these years investigating the Sinaloa Cartel and other organ organized crime organizations is that not trust to the official versions. We cannot just take the judicial documents or the version of the prosecutor or the version of the military or the policeman. No, because we, if we are talking about that many parts of the government are involucrated, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they have connections with the organized crime, many times, most of the times, they are not saying the truth. But how can we know? How can we get the other version of the things? There is just one place. Two places. The victims, many, sometimes, they, they are able to survive and tell the stories, what they saw, what they feel, why they suffer, who were involved, and their voices are crucial. We have to go to the victims to hear their testimonies. Not just in trial. We have to go there, knock the door, try to, 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 to make human contact with them, to get them their the position to one journalist. Uh, many times is more open. They don't have too much fear because the victims also know that the government many times is involved. So when they give testimonies, some information because they know, okay, if I denounce this policeman and the policeman is there, I cannot say this. So these things will never arrive to the official's documents. This is why it's important to decide we have to talk with the victims. But which is the other part that can tell what is going on there? They, the bad ones, the members of the organized crime. I have been spending the last 20 years of my life talking with them, looking for them, and trying to, to, to establish some kind of trustful, uh, how can I say, relation as a journalist and informant to try to understand. We have to, we have to go back to the essence of, the, of this. What is this essence? Yeah. Essence. essence, okay, of this. Why they are doing this? Why? Maybe it's a topic. 
question, but we have to know what is inside these people, why they want to, why, for example, one drug lord in Mexico, Arturo Beltran Leiva, can you imagine, he was able to get 400 millions of dollars per month, per month, per month. Why did he, he didn't stop? I want to know why did he, he didn't stop. Was a lot of money. Why he didn't stop? So we have to get inside the cartel, inside the people that knows him, to be able to know why they are not able to stop. So I think we have to, to spend time to penetrate the cartels, to penetrate the organized crime. Of course, with very, very, very sensitive and very, very many cautions. Because when we are also inside the, this organized crime, talking with them, we of course have to understand that the, the version could be not the good version. So what do we do? We have the version of the victims, we have the version of the government, we have the version of the organized crime, we have the leaked documents, all this. And so we have to, we, we can construct the map, but we cannot do this map if we don't talk with them. We have to go there and talk with them. So I, I, I think that um, for me, my, my main, um, how can I say it? way to do that, because I, I have been able also to penetrate their families. Right now I'm talking with their wives, with their daughters, with their um, lovers. And I'm able really to get, I, I was able finally to get very inside and try to get some of the information. Because many of, many of these members, sometimes they also want to denounce some parts of the state. Because believe it or not, I, I know this is so crazy, they feel sometimes as a victims. Because they, the government, I'm working for the government. All my, all my profits are going to their paying bribes. What, what is my money? I'm the slave of the government. <laughs> At least this happens in Mexico, you know, because they pay a lot, a lot of millions of bribes monthly to the very, very high level officials. So many times they have really very important information, sometimes some documents, proofs, videos, this, this kind of things. And, and it's very important. It's very important to, to, to be able to hear them. And my 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 recipe, if I can tell this, is find the fractures, the wake points, because is inside of this organized crime where is the weakest point. It's inside. The way to really break and destroy these crime organizations is inside. The government will do it? No. Can we do it? No. But at least we can show what is happening inside. To try to put pressure to the government, uh -uh, you have to do the, your work. You, you, you cannot go to the bed with them anymore. You have to do the job. And I think that is journalists. We have to put the things white and black, white, black and white, and try to push to the society, generate conscience, and put in, in problems to the, to the members of the government that are with these, with these people. So find fractures, the weak points, the cracks, and enter with lead feet, but don't let anyone hear you arrive. Thank you, thank you, Annabelle. So indeed, there's no no harmony in the organized crime worlds, um, and that's that's where we can uh, we can operate. But one one other thing is, these people are conspiracy theorists. Um, lots of these organized crime groups themselves, you know, finance, you know, radical parties, and uh, you know, and other things like these, and they affect politics. But whenever I mean, and I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you might have experienced this. When you call them up, they will ask you, who are you? Are you CIA? Are you FBI? Are you Mossad? Are you the Mexican uh, police? La policía mexicana? They always, you know, have the idea of a bigger enemy than you, which is a very weird form of protection for you, uh, actually. But you gotta, as uh, as Bertrand said, you gotta make sure, you know, that your 
uh, you, you have some protection, some safety, you know, and uh, legal, you know, digital and physical uh, security is of utmost importance. And we, you have some sessions here at uh, um, JJC uh, about these issues.